Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Alicia from Legacy's communications team. Um, I'm serving as the moderator for this event. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight we're going to learn everything that you need to know about vasectomy from how the procedure works to what recovery looks like to how you can best prepare to get a successful SNP. So this event is sponsored by Legacy. A little bit about what we do here. Uh, Legacy is a sperm testing and freezing company. We offer at-home semen sample collection for semen analysis testing, DNA fragmentation testing, sperm cryopreservation or sperm freezing, as well as STI testing supplements, virtual fertility consults, everything from home. So basically everything that you need to make preparing for your vasectomy a success. I'm gonna introduce Steph. Hi, Steph. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Our fertility expert tonight is Stephanie Saborin. Uh, Steph is a nurse and the head of clinical services here at Legacy. Her professional background is in urology surgery, uh, specifically in men's health, and she's been working in that space for the past 10 years. Earlier, we did some sort of like back of the napkin math and estimated that Steph has been part of like over 2,000, maybe 2,500 vasectomies. So she's very well qualified to speak on this topic. Steph is certified in andrology, which is the science of sperm, and she is a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. At Legacy, she serves as a clinical educator, and she also sees Legacy patients working with individuals and couples who are looking to better understand, improve, and preserve sperm. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Steph. Thank you. So here is what we will cover tonight. We're going to start with what to expect, um, everything from you know, what actually happens during the vasectomy? What does the procedure look like? What does the recovery look like? Will it hurt? Those kinds of questions to a vasectomy reversal. What happens if I change my mind about this procedure? And then finally, we're going to give you some tips for preparing to, for the SNP uh, so that you can have a successful procedure and really set yourself up for success moving forward. So over to you, Steph. Thank we're going to start with Lisa. what to expect. <laughs> yes, what to expect. Well, I am fairly certain that we all know what external male genitalia looks like, uh, but for some of you, you may not be as well versed on the internal structures. So I'm going to give you a super quick anatomy lesson here. So first of all, we have the scrotum. So this is, and I think we all know what that is, the bag of skin that holds and helps to protect the testicles. So your testicles are located outside of your body for a reason. Um, the testicles are where sperm are produced, and to do this, the temperature of the testicles needs to be about three and a half degrees cooler than your internal body temperature. So then we have the testes or the testicles. Now, the testes are two small organs that are found inside of the scrotum. Uh, they're responsible for making sperm, and they're also involved in producing a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a really important hormone, um, especially during male development and maturation. So this is what helps with developing muscles, the deepening of your voice during puberty, and then growing body hair. So moving on to the less known structures, we'll talk about the epididymis. So this is a long tube that's located near each testicle. The epididymis is the tube which moves the sperm from the testicles into the next structure I'm going to talk about, which is the vas deferens. So the vas deferens is a tube in which the sperm is actually stored in there. Um, and this carries the sperm out of the scrotal sac. The vas deferens sits between the epididymis and the urethra and then connects these together. So this is the area that is actually cut during a vasectomy, the vas deferens. Now, things that are not pictured on this, um, on this little, uh, icon here, but important and worth mentioning are going to be a couple other things. So the first being the seminal vesicles. So these are just sac-like glands that sit behind the bladder and they release a fluid that forms part of the semen. The rest of it comes from something called the prostate gland. So this is something that is about the size of a walnut. It surrounds the neck of the bladder and the urethra, which is the tube that carries your urine from the bladder and also the semen from your ejaculate. So the prostate gland secretes a slightly alkaline fluid that forms part of the seminal fluid, which is the fluid that carries the sperm out of the body. Now, a vasectomy, which is also referred to as male sterilization sometimes, this is a surgical form of male birth control. So this is cutting off the supply of sperm to your semen. This is done by cutting and then sealing off the vas deferens tubes that carry the sperm. So vasectomy has got a pretty low risk of problems and can usually just be performed as an outpatient procedure uh, done under what we call local anesthesia, which means you're not asleep. This is just numbing medication. 
And overall, it takes roughly anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes to perform. Now, there's two different types of vasectomy. So anyone who's looked into possibly having a vasectomy may have heard of the traditional regular vasectomy and a no scalpel vasectomy. Um, these both are outpatient procedures. So many doctors are just doing them right in the doctor's office. Uh, in some cases, there may be situations where you need to have this done in a hospital or surgical center setting. Typically, those are for people who have a difficult anatomy um, where they might be a little bit more uncomfortable and they may want to use some sedation. But typically, it's done awake with just local anesthetic. Uh, the operation really, on average, it takes about 20 minutes, but truly um, probably closer to 12 to 15 minutes. Um, and you do get to go home pretty much immediately after the procedure is finished because there's no effects of anesthesia lingering, although you should have a ride home. Now, with traditional vasectomy, your doctor is going to use that local anesthetic, which is lidocaine, uh, to numb the area around your scrotum. So they're going to use a needle. It's a very small needle, um, but they are going to use a needle to inject that lidocaine. Uh, some cases, your doctor may offer you some prescription medication prior to your procedure. If you're feeling a lot of anxiety or nervousness, typically for most people, the nervousness is around that lidocaine injection. Um, once you get past that, typically it's smooth sailing from there. Now, your doctor is then going to make one or two small incisions um, in the skin of your scrotum. So they're going to find the vas deferens. A lot of this is done by feel or palpation. Um, and then they will remove it from the body just through that tiny little opening and cut it and seal it off. Um, they're going to seal off the ends of the vas deferens by either tying or cauterizing them. And then after that, the doctor is going to close up the incision with either stitches or some surgical glue. Now, pretty much anyone is a candidate for a vasectomy procedure. Uh, which one you go through depends on a few different things. Um, and like I said, in some cases, just simple anatomy, uh, certain procedures are easier to do than others. Now, that alternative option we'll talk about is that no scalpel vasectomy. Now, with a no scalpel vasectomy, uh, your doctor is still going to need to numb the skin of your scrotum. Many people ask me, well, no scalpel means they don't open up the body. Not necessarily true. It's just a different method. Um, so they're not using the scalpel to open it. They're using um, that anesthetic, so that lidocaine, either through needle or other forms. And then uh, they're going to make an incision into the scrotum using a very sharp instrument that makes a puncture. So instead of that cut, it's just a puncture. And then sometimes they'll use that in instrument to open the puncture up a little bit, which creates like a tiny little tear in the skin. So it's not typically as big as a scalpel incision would be. Then they're going to stretch that skin so that they can see inside and perform the rest of the procedure. Uh, the technique uh, as far as the vasectomy piece goes, is exactly the same. The difference is really in how they're opening up the skin. Um, with, the, with the procedure with the no scalpel or puncture, in some cases, it can actually heal up on its own after the procedure without the need for any sutures. But in, in a lot of cases, I would say, I'd argue a lot of the no scalpel procedures that I've been a part of, um, the surgeon will still just as a precautionary, precautionary method, pop in one stitch or use some surgical glue or even just steri strips to close it up on the outside. Um, that's not uncommon to see. Um, this method, with the no scalpel method generally requires a little bit more training and skill than a traditional vasectomy would. So not all uh, urologists are gonna perform both methods. You can talk to yours and ask um, when you do go to look into this. Chances of side effects and complications are pretty low, like I said earlier with both procedures. But with the no scalpel, research shows us that we do see slightly lower issues with some of the post-operative complications like swelling, bleeding, or bruising, um, but they are pretty minimal. Now, to manage discomfort during a vasectomy, there's two different options. So the first, and what I would argue is the most common, is just going to be simple lidocaine injection. Now, this feels like a pinch and a burn or a bee sting even, um, and it really only lasts for a few seconds. And then that lidocaine takes effect pretty quickly in numbing the area. The second option is administering the lidocaine, so it's that same basic medication, but doing it through a high-pressure jet spray instrument. Now, this jet injection um, is based on the principles basically that just a small quantity of liquid that you force through a small opening under high pressure uh, can penetrate the skin. And this can do so without causing any sort of excessive tissue trauma. Now, patients are going to experience still mild discomfort and a pinch feeling, kind of like being snapped with a rubber band. 
Um, with that first spray, it is high pressure. So it's not completely painless like a lotion or a cream would be. Um, but essentially they provide about the same level of numbing for the procedure. I would say that the jet sprays are much less commonly used. Um, from my experience, it's typically just lidocaine injection. Um, you can also use quite a bit more of it when you're doing it in an injectable form. Um, so that is always a nice thing. Now, 36% of patients report some discomfort during their vasectomy. So according to research studies, there are slightly lower instances of this with the no scalpel technique versus a traditional vasectomy. Uh, there's really no reason to keep quiet or be in pain during a vasectomy procedure. Like I said, we can administer quite a lot of lidocaine during this. So it's really important just to communicate with your doctor. Let them know if you're uncomfortable. Tell them you need a minute or a little bit more of that numbing medicine. Um, don't ever just sweat it out or tough it out because it really is very easy to address. Um, also keep in mind this procedure is very quick. I would argue 12 to 15 minutes is pretty standard, um, plus or minus a few minutes on either end for setup and cleanup. But uh, it is a very fast procedure, so it isn't for long regardless. Now, post-operative uh, pain management. So post-operative pain or discomfort, not even always pain per se, is usually really well managed uh, with acetaminophen, which is also known as Tylenol, and honestly, ice. <laughs> um, we discourage aspirin or ibuprofen, so that would be your Advil or your Motrin, because that can cause issues with some increased bleeding. So we don't like people to take that after any sort of procedure, typically Tylenol and ice, so the recommendation. Now, after a vasectomy, ice truly is your best friend. If you listen to anything or take anything away from this conversation with me today, it's going to be ice, ice, and more ice. Uh, that's really what's going to get you through this. Uh, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, rotating for the first 24 to 48 hours makes such a big difference. Now, you don't have to stay up. You can sleep through the night. Uh, you don't have to set alarms. But for waking hours, really, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, just keep doing that. Icing and rest, along with some good scrotal support, works the best, not only for managing any sort of discomfort you may be experiencing, but also to help you recover faster so you can return to your normal daily activity sooner. Uh, frozen peas are my go-to. Um, I would take that over large ice cubes, honestly. Um, but if you have crushed ice in your refrigerator, that's great as well. Um, I would just always say, remember when you're dealing in ice here, you never want to place ice directly onto the skin. Ice burns are no fun, especially on the groin. Um, so just make sure you're placing it over your underwear so you have a fabric layer in between. Now, the picture you see on the right here, you might, if you're looking into vasectomies or if you've been scrolling the internet, you may have stumbled upon these. They do make underwear that have uh, little openings where you could slip an ice pack into it. Um, these are completely not necessary. Um, I, I don't ever tell patients they need to get these. You can if you want to, but you certainly don't need it. Um, and then also of note, you should never use a heating pad after this procedure. It will actually delay healing and worsen your discomfort and your swelling. So you don't want to do that. Um, so stay away from heat in this situation. So the classic frozen peas are the way to go. <laughs> Honestly, they are. <laughs> now, 95% of patients are completely pain or discomfort free um, in two weeks following vasectomy, usually much sooner than the two week mark. But at two, by two weeks, typically 95% of people have absolutely zero symptoms, issues or discomfort. Uh, the typical recovery time after a vasectomy, it's pretty quick. Uh, the more compliant you are with post-op instructions, that means the better you follow directions, uh, the better you're going to feel. So if you return to activity too quickly, you're going to be uncomfortable. Simple as. Typically, after two to three days, you can return to light activity. After seven to 14 days, you should be able to go back to the gym or resume more heavy lifting activities. But if anything, just listen to your body. So not everybody is the same. And there's a lot of guys who like to tell their vasectomy stories and they don't always tell them truthfully. So just because your buddy told you that he was out there playing ice hockey and tackle football days after his vasectomy does not mean that you should be doing that. Uh, typically I say it's a pretty good policy when you're returning to activity to go with the old adage, if it hurts, don't do it. <laughs> That's it. Pretty simple, but trust me, good advice uh, that you definitely want to take. <laughs> so let's talk about what vasectomy recovery actually looks like. So for the first few days, you should become a total couch potato. 
This is me giving you permission to do absolutely nothing for a few days. So take this opportunity to uh, catch up on your Netflix. Happy to make some show recommendations worth binging if you need them. But ice, you know, ice, ice, ice. Remember that one? Um, ice rest, scrotal support, and scrotal elevation. So scrotal elevation doesn't mean lift it up in the air. This is just think about tucking a pillow under your backside. If you're like lounging on the couch, laying on the couch with your legs up. And, you know, I tell people tuck that pillow right under your backside and then bend your knees a little bit. It's a really comfortable way to sit and lie. That's what I mean by elevation. Um, also, you should be wearing tight and supportive underwear uh, for a minimum of those first two to three days. Honestly, though, I tell patients typically seven to 14 days with good scrotal support, but listen to your body, see how you feel. Uh, when I say tight and supportive underwear, I'm talking about briefs, um, good snug fitting boxer briefs, compression shorts, that sort of thing. Now you can return to light activity after three, about three days typically. So what is light activity? So this is gonna be things like walking, taking a walk, a small walk, don't walk 10 miles, um, going to the grocery store, some light housekeeping things like doing the dishes, wipe your counters down, fold your laundry. Um, and also you can cook and do meal prep as well. You wanna avoid any sort of heavy lifting um, and return to lifting and activity gradually. Most people uh, typically are able to go back to work in just a couple days. Uh, you may need to be out uh, for a full week if your work is really strenuous and physical though. So if you've got a, a very physically demanding job, you may need a little extra time over that first two or three days. Um, but you can resume your everyday activities, honestly, within 48 to 72 hours, typically. Um, so after the procedure, um, unless your activities, like I said, are unusually vigorous or anything like that. So take it easy. So here we go. The important stuff. So here's where we are going to dive into the post vasectomy seas where the swimmers lose their way. Now, after this minor little snip snip you may be wondering about the grand finale. So this is the moment of truth, the grand exodus of the troops. Yes, we are about to talk about ejaculation. So you cannot ejaculate for seven days following your procedure. You need time to heal, and we don't need you blowing through all that fine work that your surgeon just did. To be clear, you are still fertile following that vasectomy. So if you do not want any mini knees, then you need to be using backup birth control until you complete your post vasectomy semen analysis and have confirmed that you have no sperm remaining in your semen. I'm going to say it one more time. You are still fertile. <laughs> you need to use backup birth control or <laughs> you will have surprises. <laughs> Hear that Very, important. Very important. <laughs> so when do we do that post vasectomy semen analysis? So typically post, uh, post vasectomy semen analysis is done somewhere in the vicinity of three months after having your vasectomy, no sooner. Do not try to rush back. Um, most likely you're still gonna have sperm if you're doing it prior to three months. So after that initial seven day abstinence period where we are healing and relaxing, it's off to the races. As, as many ejaculations as you can get in, as many as possible over the next three months, uh, tell your partner, I said so. Uh, it does not matter how you achieve the end result um, as long as you're doing it often. So usually we are just, people always ask, well, how many, how many? Um, typically I say, you know, we're looking for a minimum, a bare minimum of 30 ejaculations prior to testing. So if you haven't had at least that many in a three month period, you probably should consider waiting a little bit longer to do the test just so you don't have to keep repeating it over and over. Um, now, 30 is not an exact count, so don't feel like you need to tally and count them up. Um, for many people, it actually takes more than that anyway. That's just kind of a baseline rough guideline that I throw out there. So all I can say is off to the races as many as possible. And you do not need to do them all in a row. I feel like this graphic is perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is not like cramming for a test. Please don't do these all in two days. You'll hurt yourself. <laughs> not good. Uh, this needs to be over time, many months. <laughs> good point. <laughs> so let's talk then about how semen analysis testing works with legacy. So first, you can go online and order a test kit. Now, your sample is produced via masturbation and collected in the privacy and comfort of your own home, which is about a million times less awkward than doing this in a clinic setting with that creepy black leather couch and 
very outdated and overused pornographic material that nobody really wants to touch. Uh, included in your test kit is going to be a prepaid FedEx shipping label. So once you produce your sample, you simply attach that prepaid label to the outside of the box that your kit came in, and you give them a call and schedule a pickup right off your doorstep. Uh, if you don't want doorstep pickup, you can always drop it off at any FedEx uh, shipping location that's convenient to you. Um, once you do that, your sample is overnighted to our lab where it is tested, and your results are available online right in your personalized client dashboard within 24 to 48 hours. It is actually that simple. Uh, will a vasectomy affect my sex drive or my sexual function? <laughs> so men who have had a vasectomy actually report having more sex per month and better overall sexual satisfaction than men who haven't had a vasectomy. Yeah. So party's still happening, but there won't be any surprise guests nine months later. Will a vasectomy affect how my genitals look? The answer is no. Vasectomy leaves no noticeable scar. Uh, and the testicles remain completely intact and unaffected by the procedure. So you are not being neutered like a dog. We do not cut or remove your testicles. I hear that all the time. I don't want my <laughs> testicles removed. We don't do that. Um, everything will still look the same. I tell people I've, I mean, I've participated in more of these than I can count. Um, I, honestly, once you get through that very initial piece of healing for the first couple of weeks, Truly, you have to be looking so closely and it is still very <laughs> difficult and in some cases impossible to even find the scar. So um, minimal to nothing. Good news. Yes. All right. Uh, will a vasectomy affect my semen or cum, ejaculate, jizz? <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of words you can use. The answer is no. So it actually, um, it does not. Sperm make up a very small percentage of your ejaculate. Um, they are not visible to the naked eye even. So there's really no noticeable difference in volume or appearance at all to the ejaculate. It looks exactly the same. If you didn't tell someone you had a vasectomy, they would never know. Um, everything still operates and functions as it did prior to the procedure. Will a vasectomy affect my testosterone level? So we talked earlier about how um, the testicles are the place where testosterone is made. Um, so I understand why people might think this. The answer is no. So there is really no impact on testosterone levels as a result of a vasectomy. So men who've had a vasectomy have pretty much the same testosterone levels on average as men who have not. So no change. Um, this is another big question. Chances of pregnancy after vasectomy. So the chances of pregnancy and actual vasectomy failure are two different things. So Vasectomy failure, this is where tubes spontaneously reconnect, happens maybe about one in 10,000. Um, most cases of pregnancy after vasectomy are actually due to having unprotected sex before confirming the vasectomy was effective by having a semen analysis test. So I cannot stress enough the importance of doing your follow-up semen analysis testing after you have your vasectomy. Um, okay, so we've talked about how vasectomy is very effective. It's a permanent form of birth control. What happens if someone changes their mind? Let's talk about that. So that's a great question. Um, if you prepared in advance and froze your sperm prior, you're in really good shape. <laughs> um, you can always conceive using frozen sperm anytime after a vasectomy. Um, your other options, you do have some other options if you did not prepare. Um, your other options would be via surgical procedures. So something, one of them is called a TESI procedure. This is a testicular sperm extraction. Um, it is a surgical procedure uh, where a small portion of tissue is actually removed from the testicle. Um, and then under a microscope, they're analyzing to see if they can find any viable sperm cells from the testicular tissues that are extracted. Um, those can be used for IVF if they find any. Um, the other option is a vasectomy reversal. Uh, so this is going to be surgery um, uh, to reverse or undo, so to speak, a vasectomy. Now, during the procedure, a uh, surgeon is going to be reconnecting each of the tubes, the vas deferens tubes that carry the sperm from the testicle into the semen. So we are going to talk a little bit more about vasectomy reversal in just a second, but um, I want to talk about how common it is for people to change their mind. Like, do people regret this and why? They do. Um, about, not everyone regrets it, but about one in 10 men who have a vasectomy do regret having the procedure. Uh, some of the most common reasons for regretting the vasectomy include things that we don't always think about at the time of a vasectomy. So first off is 
relationship changes. Um, changes in marital status like divorce or the loss of a partner can lead to some regret if a person's circumstances or desires regarding children change. Um, entering into a new relationship where the new partner desires children um, and maybe doesn't have them can also lead to regret if you've already undergone a vasectomy and can't fulfill your partner's wishes for biologic children. So that happens often. Uh, the next is going to be just the desire to have children or to have more children if you haven't had any yet. Um, some individuals uh, potentially could undergo a vasectomy thinking, I just don't ever want children and I know I don't want children, um, but later have a change of heart and maybe want to have them or want to have more because they thought they were done and they're ready to have another. Um, we see this often, I would say quite a bit with people who choose to have a vasectomy at younger ages. So um, especially those who didn't have any children at the time of the procedure, uh, very common, but even sometimes crazy people like myself. I had three children of my own and as they were all moving on in age and getting older and going off, I had that crazy thought um, in conversation with my husband about should we think about one more? <laughs> um, it happens. We thought we were done. Um, so you never know. Um, also loss of a child. This is something I hate talking to people about, but the reality is, um, and it's, it's tragic, but the loss of a child either through death or other circumstances can prompt individuals to reconsider their decision initially to undergo a vasectomy if they now can have no more. Um, also changes in financial situation. Now this is kind of a positive one. Um, significant changes in financial stability or an increase in financial resources um, can lead people to reconsider their decision to undergo a vasectomy, especially if they're feeling more capable of financially supporting additional children. A lot of people do just think they can't afford more children and hey, maybe you'll hit the Powerball or come into money somehow or get a big <laughs> raise um, and that's all positive. So um, lastly, pressure. Pressures from family or society, really. Um, external pressures from family members or partners to have the vasectomy um, can really influence someone's decision to have one, which may potentially be against their true wishes. They may not want to have it, um, but might do it just for their partner's sake. And that can sometimes lead to subsequent regret um, in doing it at all. Okay, so let's talk about what a re reversal kind of like entails. I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if I change my mind, I'll just reverse it. So is it really that simple? It's not. <laughs> I hear it all the time. And I remember, you know, patients would come in even to have, you know, their initial appointments with us to consult for a vasectomy. And they'd say, yeah, we always explain this is a permanent procedure. And they'll say, oh, that's okay. If I change my mind, I'll reverse it. And we say, oh, no, no, put on the brakes. So <laughs> Vasectomies should be considered permanent procedures. Um, a vasectomy reversal success is directly correlated to the skill level of the surgeon performing the reversal procedure. So the difficulty of a vasectomy reversal can vary depending on a few different factors. So this is a really delicate and complex procedure. So think about trying to operate on a cooked piece of angel hair pasta, so thinner than spaghetti, um, except that piece of angel hair pasta has a hollow center and you need to precisely realign it. That's pretty much what a vasectomy reversal is like. <laughs> so this is no easy task. You need a surgeon who is very well practiced and skilled operating under a microscope, which is very difficult. I have scrubbed into so many vasectomies, but when you talk about trying to work under a microscope versus real life up close, just with your own eyes, uh, not dealing with microscopes, it is very different. Mm -hmm. um, not all surgeons uh, have the skill set to even, or expertise to even do this. Most urologists will not even attempt a reversal procedure. Um, it is done using very specialized instruments that are not used often. It's under a microscope. And like I said, not all can or even will agree to perform it at all. So sometimes it can even be difficult to find someone in your area that's willing to take it on. Mm -hmm. So to add, you know, to add a little extra level of difficulty, imagine uh, if the surgeon did some crazy stuff during the VAS, uh, you know, the first time around. Happens all the time. Um, again, we are trying to make this permanent. So <laughs> maybe they cut out a piece of the VAS deference. That's to help reduce the risk of them spontaneously reconnecting. Maybe they put in an extra knot. Maybe um, they do something else. Um, sometimes it's a cauterize and a knot and a seal it off and a tie it extra. We do all sorts of things to make sure this vasectomy works. Um, the end goal is that we're making it permanent. Well, 
that makes a reversal that much harder. Yeah. So also the longer that it's been since the initial vasectomy, the more likely it is to have some sort of stubborn scar tissue gumming up the works or causing additional problems. Um, so important considerations um, are going to be the type of vasectomy. So uh, for instance, if it involved removing a segment of the vas, like I said, or, um, you know, that could make the procedure that much more challenging uh, than if it, the vas was just cut and sealed alone. Uh, the time, so obviously the longer it's been, something that needs to be considered. Um, over time, scar tissue can form at the site of the vasectomy, but also just within the scrotal tissues, making it more difficult to access and then reconnect the vas deferens. And then anatomy. So variations in individuals' anatomy can impact the difficulty of the reversal. Um, factors like the presence of scar tissue, like I said, the location of where your vasectomy site is, um, and the quality of what's remaining of the vas deferens tissue that you're even able to work with. Um, sometimes that's limited. So we'll talk about vasectomy reversal recovery time. Um, so this is a little trickier than a traditional vasectomy. So recovery time is about two to three times longer uh, than a regular vasectomy recovery. Um, you should expect to have to rest for at least five to seven days. And these are all minimums. Um, for some, it's gonna be longer. Um, you're also gonna be wearing tight supportive underwear or jock strap for seven or more days, typically more. Um, and usually you can return to work after about seven days, but it is going to be longer if your job entails any sort of that heavy lifting or if you operate a jackhammer for a living or something. Um, and you can typically get back to the gym after this procedure in usually about six weeks, four to six weeks, but um, typically they're going to have you wait till six weeks. So a little bit more difficult. Now, patency rates. I want to talk about this. This is not pregnancy rate. Patency rate is referring to the percentage of vasectomy reversals that result in sperm being able to re-enter the ejaculate. So a reversal is most likely to work if it's done in the first three years after a vasectomy. Um, reversals do not always work. So the vas deferens, like I said, is that very narrow tube. And with reversal surgery, it may actually become permanently blocked. If that alignment isn't exactly precise, you could actually just permanently block it off. And you've just undergone all of this surgery uh, all for naught. So factors that are impacting, obviously, the patency rates are going to be things like I mentioned, the, how long it's been since that initial vasectomy how the initial vasectomy healed, which is completely unpredictable. And like I said before, the skill level and experience of the surgeon performing it. Now, pregnancy rates after vasectomy reversal can be as low as 30%. Um, and that's if it was even successful at all. So why is this so much lower? So just because sperm re-enters the semen doesn't mean that the semen's healthy. So sperm count or quality can be low. Uh, sperm can be damaged by trauma to um, the testes, blockages, scarring. Um, also, repeated surgery can introduce something called anti-sperm antibodies. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what that means is that when a man undergoes surgery involving the reproductive tract, whether vasectomy or something else, or a vasectomy reversal, the body's immune system may actually start to recognize the sperm as foreign invaders. So this is due to exposures of sperm to the immune system um, as a result of the surgery. So this recognition of them as invaders can trigger the production of antibodies against the sperm. So essentially your body will be attacking its own sperm, making it difficult or in most cases almost impossible to conceive at all. So just one added level of complication that you probably didn't want or need. <laughs> now, money. Money plays a big part in the decision to reverse a vasectomy. So reversals are never covered by insurance. Um, cost varies based on your provider, where in the country you live, where it's being performed. Um, now, I think we can all probably agree here that nobody wants a bargain basement surgery on their genitals. So although there may technically be options in the seven to $8,000 price range, I would expect to spend a little bit higher of an amount, uh, especially if you want it to actually be successful. Um, you also need to factor in the cost of monthly semen analysis tests. These are required by all surgeons performing reversals. Um, and you're doing this monthly for 12 months and sometimes even longer after the vasectomy reversal procedure. So 
this cost typically equates the cost of buying a new car uh, in most cases. So let's talk about preparing for your vasectomy. Um, if we don't want to potentially go through a reversal um, and we want to set ourselves up for success in the future, what are some things that people can do to get ready for this? So, um, so great question. So I briefly mentioned sperm freezing earlier, but I'm going to show you a breakdown cost comparison of sperm storage before a vasectomy versus vasectomy reversal, because this is probably one of the most common things people want to talk about. First off, it's does it does all of this hurt? It's always about pain first. The second is about money always. So we'll talk <laughs> about the money. <laughs> so cost first. So semen analysis, test, freezing, and five years of storage. All of those things together will, will run you about a thousand dollars. Now, not everyone pays a thousand dollars. This can be covered in part or even in full um, by some health insurance plans or even fertility benefits, which you might have through your employer. Most people don't even know they have them. Uh, this is something you can check with your HR department to see if that is available to you. Um, but for many people, they're just paying a copay or making sure they're hitting their deductible, but not everyone even has to pay for this testing or freezing um, or storage. Now, in comparison, a vasectomy reversal is never covered by insurance. Um, it also ranges, like I said, 7,200 to 30,000, depending on where you go. And like I said before, I'm sure we don't want to seek out that bargain basement surgery for our genitals. So expect that it's on that upper end. Um, and so there is quite a significant difference here. Now talk about pain. So sperm storage is painless. <laughs> uh, really, all you need to do is masturbate to the point of ejaculation. So you're already doing that. Uh, I'd argue that it's not only pleasurable, but it's not even inconvenient. So it's something you're already doing. Now, to the contrary, vasectomy reversal surgery is pretty painful, uh, not only on your wallet, but also physically painful for weeks postoperatively. Um, so these are things that you want to think about. Uh, pregnancy rates. With frozen sperm, uh, pregnancy rates are up to 60% on average. With vasectomy reversal, there's no guarantee of success at all. Um, if it is successful, uh, pregnancy rates range anywhere from zero to upwards of 70% though. So it's a really broad spectrum. That means you could actually go through all of this reversal surgery and still not conceive and still require IVF to conceive. Um, so it's a definite consideration. And then sperm quality is really important to talk about too. So a frozen sperm sample never degrades. So this means that if let's say 30 year old you freezes your sperm uh, and you use it in 10 or 15 years or more, um, it is still as if 30 year old you is conceiving that child. Um, with a vasectomy reversal, just like with the natural conception, your sperm quality continues to decline over time uh, with age, as well as impacts um, from environmental factors. So you have new genetic mutations that continue to develop in sperm uh, every year over year. DNA fragmentation increases in your sperm every year of age and motility and morphology decrease, making it even more difficult to conceive at all. And those are just age related factors. Um, and so all things that you'd want to think about while trying to make this decision. Also, I feel like something that this this table doesn't talk about is that if you get a vasectomy reversal and then you decide that you don't want kids again in the future, then you have to have another vasectomy. <laughs> you literally do. <laughs> you have to go through all of it all over again. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, definitely something worth considering. <laughs> um, now, how to freeze your sperm. So very similar to how to produce your sample when I went through earlier today, but we'll revisit this quickly. Um, sperm freezing is usually divided up into three simple steps. Um, with Legacy, you get to do the first step at home. Um, masturbating at home, much better than in a public location. Uh, so freezing sperm from home, simple process. You're collecting that sample uh, from home. Samples picked up, like I said before, FedEx right off your doorstep. Uh, once it's at the lab, it is tested. You're going to see those results in 24 to 48 hours, and it is subsequently frozen right then and there. That's it. Simple, simple. Uh, this can all be done without ever seeing a doctor. Uh, no special orders are required for this testing. No referrals are needed. No six-month wait list to get an appointment at the andrology lab because it is becoming more and more difficult to get those appointments for your post-vasectomy semen analysis testing. Um, and you eliminate that awkward clinic experience like the aforementioned dreaded black leather couch and overused pornographic materials. I can't think <laughs> of anything grosser. <laughs> so, 
I want to walk you through what this process looks like in the lab. So we talked about what we have to do to produce the sample and how to get there. Now let's talk about what happens. So first, once we receive it, the sample is analyzed. We do a semen analysis. Um, and potentially if someone ordered a DNA fragmentation test, uh, we could do that as well. Um, but it is the sperm in sample is washed using a sperm wash solution. Um, and then it's separated into four separate vials. Next, we add a cryoprotectant solution to it. And this is what protects the sample to undergo the freezing process. And then the vials are placed into cryogenic tanks where they are exposed to either liquid nitrogen or liquid nitrogen vapor at temps of negative 196 degrees Celsius. So this is very cold. Um, this equates to about negative 320.8 degrees Fahrenheit, if you want to measure it in Fahrenheit. So, uh, <laughs> so chilly temps. Uh, once this process is complete, a uh, very small sample of um, a small portion of each sample is thawed and we do a post-thaw motility analysis. Now, this is something that most labs do not do on the front end, but is so valuable um, and such valuable information to have up front because this is going to help you understand and determine what your options are going to be to use your sample in the future. Um, it can be very difficult if you think you're going to be having IUI and you have your sample sent to your clinic and everybody is ready to move forward. You've been on a regimen of meds and you show up for IUI to find out that they thaw your sample, which they can't thaw until right before they do it, and find out that you have not enough motility for IUI and IVF is your only option. Now you cannot refreeze that vial and you need a reproductive endocrinologist, a whole different provider to perform that procedure than the IUI. So, and it also can't be done just in the doctor's office. So now you've wasted an entire vial if you didn't have that post thaw motility. Um, and not only did you waste an entire vial, but the money that it costs to save that. And then also the ability to have, like, how many vials did you store? Do you have enough to work with in the future? So um, that piece alone is so invaluable. Okay, so for those of you who are visual learners, we have a little video of basically exactly what Steph just went through. So we'll talk through it. Um, so what happens during sperm freezing? Um, as a first step, like Steph mentioned, the sample is processed, it's washed, it's analyzed. Um, this similar sort of analysis will also happen at the end of the process in a post-thaw. So basically that, that post-thaw motility check that Steph just mentioned. Um, it's combined with a cryoprotectant, which is a substance that draws water out of the cells. Uh, to prevent damage during freezing um, and ultimately it is plunged into the liquid nitrogen which is kind of the fun like <laughs> shot of the, of the process um, the where, it, <laughs> yeah, where it cools it to a negative 196 degrees celsius much colder than your at home freezer so this is not something you can really do without the uh, the help of the lab and uh, once it's in there it does not degrade uh, like steph mentioned earlier it is literally frozen in time it can be stored indefinitely and there have been healthy pregnancies from frozen sperm after i think like 40 or 50 years of sperm being frozen um, so it's really sort of a um, an investment into options for a very long time yeah i think the oldest sample that was ever used in IVF uh, to conceive a child was in storage. I always forget if it's either 47 or 48 years in storage mm -hmm. yeah. uh, before it was used. So pretty wild. Now at negative 196 degrees Celsius, like we said, very cold, um, all biological activity inside a cell is paused or literally frozen. So this is what's happening when we say that you are essentially freezing time when you freeze your sperm because you are freezing all biologic activity. So truly you're freezing time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the cryogenic facility. So where is the sperm sort of sent after it's frozen. Um, so Legacy uh, has a, a few cryogenic facility partners um, that, that they use for long-term sperm storage. Um, these facilities are monitored 24 seven with video and digital alarms. They are rigor rigorously screened for safety and security by the FDA and the CDC. Um, and there are backup power sources in case of a natural disaster, a blackout, something like that. So um, these are this is a highly secure situation. Um, I would say, I used to work at a fertility clinic. So I, I say this sort of situation is much more secure than like having your sperm frozen in a clinic lab uh, where there aren't as many sort of like backup um, protocols. Um, and as an added level of safety and security, 
Legacy uses multi-site storage. Um, this is our default. So basically what that means is, um, Steph mentioned earlier that there are four vials of, of sperm. Every sample gets divided into four vials. We send two vials to uh, one location and two vials to another location. So this is really a way to further reduce and mitigate risk. So if like there was some freak accident, like, I don't know what, sinkhole opened up and swallowed one cryogenic facility, um, you would still have vials securely frozen in a separate location. So it's an excellent uh, form of backup for your backup. <laughs> yes. And as far as I know, I have never heard of a sinkhole opening up, swallowing a cryogenic building as of yet. So uh, you can feel pretty good about this. <laughs> the chances <laughs> are case. quite low, but it is good to know that yeah. if it happens, you have options. <laughs> just in case you do have options. You also have a few options in how you can use your frozen sample in the future. So one of those options is IUI. So during an IUI or intrauterine insemination, uh, sperm is placed directly into the uterus using a small catheter. Now, the goal of this treatment is to improve the chances of fertilization by increasing the number of healthy sperm that reach a fallopian tube. This is when a woman is most fertile that this is done. IUI is a pretty widely used treatment option because it's minimally invasive. It is painless, really. No more discomfort than a pap smear test would be done. Um, it can be performed right in a doctor's office um, or clinic. It does not require a reproductive endocrinologist to perform the procedure. So any um, nurse midwife or OBGYN um, or nurse practitioner can perform that procedure. Now, the alternative option is something called IVF or IVF with ICSI or ICSI. It's abbreviated. Um, IVF is in vitro fertilization. So this is a type of assistive reproductive technology where sperm and an egg are fertilized outside of the human body. Um, IVF is a pretty complex process. This involves retrieving eggs from ovaries. This is a surgical procedure. Um, and then manually combining them in a Petri dish with sperm in a lab for fertilization. So several days after you do that, um, after you do the fertilization piece, the fertilized egg would now be called an embryo. Um, that's as the cells divide and multiply, it becomes an embryo. Um, and then it would be placed or implanted inside of a uterus. So one more procedure. Now, pregnancy doesn't actually occur until or if the embryo can implant itself in the uterine wall. So this procedure needs to be facilitated by a reproductive endocrinologist. This needs to be done in a fertility clinic setting. It can't just be done in your doctor's office. Um, it's definitely a much more complicated process. Um, ICSI, that IVF with ICSI, is just another technique of performing IVF, except instead of combining the sperm and the egg in a Petri dish and letting fertilization happen on its own, you would actually be under a microscope injecting a sperm directly into the egg to fertilize the egg. That's the main difference between traditional IVF and IVF with ICSI. So are IUI and IVF um, and IVF with ICSI all options for people who are using frozen sperm as opposed to fresh? Good question. So yes, um, but it comes with a little bit of a caveat that there, there's actually minimum concentration and motility requirements for IUI to take place. So those sperm need to be swimming and they need to be able to reach the egg. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where having that post-thaw motility analysis up front really can help you and determine you and your doctor both determining which procedure is going to be right for you. Um, uh, the ICSI process is an option even for people with virtually no motility or even very limited numbers of sperm. Um, you can work with extremely no, low numbers um, to perform an IVF with ICSI procedure. So that's an option for everybody. Now, IUI, all attempts, um, will take multiple for most people, including costs of sperm freezing prior, all in is gonna be about five to $10,000. Um, vasectomy reversal surgery, again, cause everybody loves to talk about money. Uh, vasectomy reversal surgery is about eight to 30,000 with no guarantee of success. Uh, many people who have vasectomy reversals do still need to do other procedures in order to conceive. So that can come at an additional cost, let's say, if you needed to go through IVF because the reversal wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. um, there is another option that I talked about a little earlier called a TESI procedure or micro um, This is the surgical sperm extraction I talked about. Um, that When that happens, when they do those procedures, um, they can only be used in IVF um, or IVF typically with ICSI. Um, 
this also comes at a very hefty price tag. Um, that comes in at about twenty six to fifty one thousand um, dollars. And like I said earlier, I mean, I can think of a lot of other things I could do with fifty thousand extra dollars. <laughs> that is a car. <laughs> um, so yeah, something to think about. That boat I always wanted, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we on the home stretch. Um, let's yes. talk about what people can do to uh, make sure that they have their checklist ready. Yes. So. Easy checklist. So things to keep in mind. These are things you want to be prepared for before having your vasectomy. Number one, please just freeze your sperm before you do it. <laughs> um, this serves as an insurance policy, so to speak, uh, just in case you change your mind. Um, things happen. Life happens. P people are not expecting a lot of those things I mentioned earlier um, as far as why people change their minds. But having something frozen gives you peace of mind. Um, also, you're going to want to time out your procedure with the plan that you're going to need to be out of work for one to two days or potentially longer if you are the jackhammer operator or something like that. <laughs> um, but you're going to want to plan that. We see a lot of vasectomies on Fridays um, because then people are off for the weekend and then right back to work on Monday. Um, some people like to maximize all their time off and, and work it out to their schedule to have even extra time. That's fine, too. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have some tight fitting supportive undergarments. So this is going to be things like briefs, compression shorts, or even a jock strap. Jock strap was the go-to recommendation years ago. Um, and just people don't use them anymore and they're very uncomfortable. I find compression shorts to be much more reasonable. So I'd say go buy some of those, but any of those will work. Um, and also stock up on ice or those favorites of mine, frozen peas. Um, <laughs> frozen peas actually give you better coverage uh, and can be used over and over again. Uh, just label them so nobody goes and cooks them and eats them at any point. But um, <laughs> you want to have enough on hand if you're using something like frozen peas to account for the time it takes to refreeze. So one bag is not enough, two may not be enough. So you want to have a couple um, because it's going to thaw. You're going to throw it in the freezer. It takes some time to freeze back up solid again. Um, and lastly, plan your post vasectomy testing. So like I said before, and I'll say 100 times over, your vasectomy is not successful until your post vasectomy says so. Um, it needs to show that you have no remaining sperm. So it's not a bad idea to throw a calendar reminder in for yourself for three plus months out, uh, just reminding yourself to do the test. You should be using backup birth control the entire time leading up to doing that test. Um, and that test can be done either using an at-home option like Legacy, or you could go in person and have that weird experience in the clinic if that's your jam. Um, mm -hmm. Just remember, you are still fertile until a doctor tells you otherwise. So you must be using that backup birth control. So um, I've kept you on for plenty long. Thank you so much for sticking with me tonight. I hope that this information helps you to go into your vasectomy or your vasectomy decision feeling a little bit more prepared. So thank you.